This morning's message, I, I felt like that there was no better place to start a family series than looking at the idea of family foundation. What is the foundation for family? I invite your attention to the very first book of Scripture, Genesis. So find page one of your Bible, if you will, or I don't know how they have pages on the electronic devices, but if you have your hard copy, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 today in this series uh, message entitled Family Foundation. We're going to begin reading with Genesis 1, 26, reading through verse 28. Then we will move to Genesis chapter 2, reading verse 18, and then verses 20 through 25. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his, Im his own image. In the image of God, he created him Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then turn one page to Genesis chapter 2 if you need to. And we're going to look at verse 18 and then 20 through 25. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Verse 20, where it picks up with, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this cause, or for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh." The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and chapter 2, verses, verse 18 and 20 through 25. As we begin this series today, we want to just focus in on family. When it comes to this word family, when you hear that word, no doubt there is an image that comes to your mind, a, a picture as you think about family. Maybe for some of you, you think of the immediate family, those, those individuals within your house, the, the four walls of your house, if you, if you will, and, and this is family. That maybe is the image that comes to your mind when you hear family. Now, for me, it, uh, those of you who are in the empty nest stage, uh, maybe your version or your picture of family is a little bit more expanded because I think of family being as more than just Diane and I in our house, but I think of it as our adult children as they're out doing life and, and now our grandchildren, that's family, that's what comes to mind when I think of family. And then some of you maybe have a larger picture and think of extended family. And so when you hear the word family, you think not only of those within the four walls of your house and your children who are grown and away, but maybe you add to that grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. You, you have this big picture and all of these are accurate views or accurate descriptions of family. As we think about family, for some of us, it brings a, a, a smile to our face. It, it brings a, a, a happiness. It brings joy. It brings good memories as we remember the things we did as a family, the places we went, the games we played, the, maybe the, the honoriness to one another that went on in the home. And yet probably for some of you, when you think of family, it's not a pleasant thought because maybe your family growing up was dysfunctional or maybe even today your family is, is just not working well together. 
This whole idea of family brings with it a, a wide range, I believe, of emotions and feelings and, and thoughts about family. When it comes to family, we know this. The family is under attack by Satan. Now, that's not anything new. Uh, Satan has been attacking the family uh, foundation, the family uh, entity from the very beginning. There is dysfunction as soon as sin came in. Well, in fact, sin was an attack on the family unit. And, and then we see the ramifications of that throughout history, even to today. And we know, folks, that the family is under attack today, majorly by the enemy. We don't have time to go through a whole lot of examples of that, but let me just give you one example of how the family is being attacked today, and it has to do with children and parents and marriage. Pew Research gave these statistics. In 1960, 73% of children in the United States lived in a home with two married parents in their first marriage. That was 19. 60. Jump forward 20 years, and that number in 1980 was down to 61% of children in the U.S. lived in a family with two married parents in their first marriage. And then if you fast forward 35 years to 2015, less than 50% of children in the United States today live in a home with two married parents in their first marriage marriage, 46%. The family is under attack. Not only is the family under attack from the breakup of homes, but the biblical view of marriage as being between one man and one woman is now viewed in some corners as old-fashioned or maybe even closed-minded. The family is under attack. In a couple of the articles that I read dealing with family, uh, there is something that is not new, but it's becoming more and more, more prevalent. It's called cohabitation. And in one article that I read, cohabitation is now called the new normal. It's kind of this idea of try it before you buy it mentality. Casey Copen of the CDC, Center of Disease Control, says that cohabitation serves as an alternative to marriage. That is becoming prevalent, more and more prevalent in our day, and sadly, it's becoming prevalent within the church. That does not, fo that does not follow the scripture. But not only are, is, the, is the family under attack in this area, but there is a normalization today where same-sex partners are promoted as an acceptable alternative to the traditional family. And that's being pushed upon our culture more and more and more. The question is, how did the family get to where it is today? How did we get to where there was such brokenness and such twistedness when it comes to the family as God has described it and prescribed it? I believe the answer to that question is this. The biblical foundation of family has been forgotten and abandoned. I believe that's why we have come to the place we are today. We just came out of a series dealing with truth, and we understand that the Bible is the foundational truth, the absolute truth by which we are to live. As we walk through the next five weeks in this series, we want to view the family and every aspect of the family that we're going to explore through a biblical lens. 
And my prayer for each of us is that as we read the Scripture, as we study the Scripture, if we see an area in our family, in our marriage, in our children, something that is not in alignment with the Word of God, absolute truth, that God would give us the courage and the desire to want to align our lives and our families with His Word because He tells us if we follow His truth, there is stability, there is a solid foundation that we can build our lives lives and our families and our homes on. And my prayer for you is that you will listen very carefully to what the Scripture has to say and will allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life. And if there is any area that you need to change or that I need to change, that each of us will be willing to do that. As we go through this series, I will tell you this, it will not be my intent to be offensive in the presentation of the truth. But I must give you a caution. The Bible is not politically correct. And so some of the things that we look at may run counterculture and may be offensive. And, and here's, my, here's my thought, folks. If the scriptural truth offends us and pricks our conscience and makes us say, ouch, I'm good with that. If the way I present biblical truth is offensive... I want to apologize for that, but I will not, I cannot apologize for the truth of the Scripture when the Scripture challenges our lives. So are we good to go? Yes. Okay. The foundation of family. We're going to spend our time this morning in these first two chapters of Genesis, and, and I was actually really... Um, I don't know if surprised is the right word, but it was really interesting when, when I stopped to see what the Scripture is saying to discover how much we can learn from these first two chapters about family and the foundation of it. So we're going to look at like seven or eight uh, characteristics of the family foundation in these first two chapters. First of all, we're going to see that family is made of people. Isn't that a novel thought? We all understand that people comprise family, or family is comprised of people. And what we learn very early on in this passage is that God made people in his image. Guess what? Family is God's idea. It's not something that man came up with. God creates people in his image. Now, what does that mean? That when we look at verse 26, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. What does it mean? Does it mean we are gods? No. But what it does mean is that a pure, perfect, holy God has made human beings in his image and he's given us some of his traits like the ability to love. We have a, have a sense of justice and truth. We, we have the ability to think. We're alive. We have personality. He's given us various characteristics or traits. We call them communicable traits, things that he can give us that is like him. And he did this for a reason. Now we, made in his image with many of the traits that he has, can have a relationship with him. We are made in his image, in his likeness. And my thought is, if God creates people, that as a creator, he has the right to define the structure or the foundation under which we should function. Does that make sense? If he created us, he knows everything about us, does it make sense that he should then have the right and have the knowledge as to what is best for us? Yes? Okay, making sure we're tracking here this morning. So the first thing we see from Genesis 1:26 is that people are made in the image of God and we know that people are part of family. A second thing that we notice is uniqueness. Uniqueness. Look at uh, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. 
male and female, he created them. What we discover is that God created male and female. You say, well, yeah, I know that. Why are you emphasizing that? Well, let me tell you why I'm emphasizing that. Because in our world today, in our society today, there is a whole lot of messed up thinking when it comes to male and female. We tend to, and we've, for historically, I guess we would say it this way, we've typically called male and female the, the two sexes, right? When we hear the word, uh, what sex are you? We, male or female. Uh, the word gender has also historically been a word that is synonymous with the sex of an individual. Your, what is your gender or what is your sex? We use them interchangeably. But things have changed. Uh, today, and, and I believe this is accurate, when we speak of someone's sex, it is based on biological factors like reproductive organs, genes, and hormones. But no longer does the word gender have a synonymous meaning to the word sex, the sex of a person. Today, gender means how you identify internally, how you identify. So, so you may have a particular biological makeup, but I don't feel like, what was the old country song? Man, I feel like a woman or something like that, you know? <laughs> Um, so that maybe that isn't a new thing. But, but here's the problem, folks. When we look at Scripture, it is very, very clear. God made people in his image, and he made them what? Male and female, period. But here's what's interesting. Depending on your resources, there are between 12 and 64 gender identities today. I just kind of like to look at the scripture and go, what did God say? I made male and female. Now, in this issue of male and female, there is the idea of uniqueness. Because men and women are not the same, right? Do we need a biology class? <laughs> men and women are not the same. We're unique. God made us that way, uniquely made in his image, male and female. So there is uniqueness in marriage or, or in family. Now let's go to the third idea that we can grab from the scripture. God made people. He made them uniquely different, but there is equality when it comes to family or to people. Male and female are created in God's image. Though there is uniqueness between the sexes, there is also equality. Why am I pushing on this one a little bit? There are some circles where it is viewed that somehow men are superior to women. We don't find that anywhere in Scripture, that the male is superior to the female. We are both made in God's image, uniquely different, but we are equal. When we look at the scripture, you know, one, some pushback may be, but wasn't the Bible written in a very patriarchal day, a very male-dominant way? Yes, it was, both Old and New Testament. But even in the midst of that male-dominant society, we find no evidence in scripture of inferiority or superiority between males and females. In fact, we find time and time again, women being identified and lifted up and, and shown how important they are. Many women in the Bible are spoken of, 
with high regard, women like Sarah and Ruth and Deborah the judge, Mary Magdalene, Priscilla. That's just a handful of the women of the scripture. It emphasizes the importance of women, but not making them superior to, nor making men superior to. There is equality in the family design between men and women and between parents and children, equality. Some of you may be saying, well, wait, 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 wait. What about in marriage? Well, when we get to the marriage message in two, two weeks from now, um, we're going to discover that God has some unique roles within marriage, but there is no indication in his unique roles within the confines of marriage that there is superiority and inferiority. So there is uniqueness, there is equality. And then when we get to verse 28, we find as part of the family foundation, reproduction. Verse 28 says, be fruitful and increase in number. Now let me just give a, a little quick background. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are not accounts of two different incidents. Genesis 1 is a very uh, succinct story of the creation. God said, this happened. God said, this happened. God made man in his image. Male and female, he made them. We get to chapter 2, and chapter 2 of Genesis kind of opens it up and gives us a little bit more details about the creation of man and about the creation of woman. And as you go a little further in chapter 2, we, we find this wording of wife, which gives us the, the understanding that there is a marriage that has taken place. There's a husband and wife. And so we can understand verse 28 of chapter 1, be fruitful and increase in number. God is saying within the bounds of marriage, I've given you an incredible delight of reproduction, of procreation, and within the bounds of marriage, that's where I want family to continue to be moved forward and I want you to fill the earth and be fruitful in it. I came across an, a, a very amazing fact that you'll be shocked at. Were it not for procreation, none of us would be here. <laughs> Isn't that just novel? I, I mean, that's just, that, probably you never thought of that. But do you realize that reproduction is a part of God's plan, his foundation for family? Reproduction. And we could go off on some areas on this that, you know, but I'm not able, we weren't able, or we understand. But just, we're looking at the foundation of family. And part of family foundation is the issue or the the wonderful thing of reproduction, procreation. So we have uniqueness, we have equality, we have reproduction, and then we have responsibility. Responsibility, again in verse 28, the second part of it says, to fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth and subdue it. What in the world does that mean, to fill the earth and subdue it? Well, the word subdue here carries with it the idea of taking care of something or of conquering something. And it seems that what God is saying in this particular passage is, I've given you the earth. I've given you its resources. You are to have control of the animals. You are to have control of the resources. You are to take those resources and be creative with them. Use them for your benefit. Don't misuse them. Don't waste them, but take care of it. I, I like what one author said. Human beings have the God-given authority to chop down trees, build buildings, domesticate animals, and eat meat. Hallelujah for that part. <laughs> Human beings also have the responsibility to do those things responsibly. We're to take care of what God has given us. We are to be good stewards of the earth that God has given us. Now, I want you to notice this. This responsibility was a co-responsibility. 
It was something that Adam and Eve, it was, it was a command that they were given together. God didn't say, Adam, now here's what you need to do. You need to fill the earth and conquer it, subdue it. And Eve, you stay home, be barefoot and pregnant. That's not what he says, is it? He tells them, fill the earth, subdue it. Both of you, as you walk through life together, you as a family, as God blesses you with children, as you, you, you take care and use the resources I've given you, that's your responsibility. So there's responsibility when it comes to this foundation of family. A sixth thing we notice is that with family, there is companionship. Companionship. Turn with me to Genesis 2 and look at verse 18. God says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And those men who are married in this room say amen to that. It is not good for the man to be alone. Now, I, wanna, I, wanted you, I want you to notice something here. Notice when God says this and what takes place next. I had never really paid attention to this until I was studying this. God says it's not good for the man to be alone. Then he brings the animals to Adam because Eve wasn't yet created. And Adam names the animals. And I, I'm guessing, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing they came maybe in pairs, male and female. Because at the end of this, we get to verse 20, I believe it is. Yeah, the end of verse 20. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Just a couple side notes. It seems that there is to be some level of relationship between man and beast, man and animals but not in a companionship kind of way. Because after Adam named the animals, God says, or the scripture says, uh, no suitable helper for Adam was found. And so then God does something. God puts Adam under anesthetic, <laughs> knocks him in the head or does something, I don't know. And then he performs the first surgery, takes a rib out and, and then he forms this beautiful, beautiful creature that Adam had never seen. And I say creature in the nicest sense of the word. And, and God then wakes Adam up and he, in a marriage ceremony, he brings this woman to Adam. And Adam says, whoa, man. And, and that's how we get woman. <laughs> and, and so he, he brings them together. And he says, this is a suitable helper for Adam. I want us to look at this word, these words suitable helper for a moment. There may be some who view those words as somewhat derogatory or somehow demeaning. A suitable helper. It's kind of like, you know, here's Adam and someone's going to come alongside and just, he's just going to be the helper, kind of second rate. No, 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 no. The word, words suitable helper mean to come alongside, to assist, to complete. Or another word that we could use is compliment, not as in giving you a, a compliment, but to, to you come to, the two come together in a way and they satisfy one another, they complete. One has areas of weakness, the other has strengths that that complement the weakness and they come together to complete one another as they journey through life. Suitable helper, folks, is not a demeaning term. In fact, just so you know, when you come to the Psalms, you read at various places where it says God is our help. He's a very present help in time of trouble. It's the very word that is used here to talk about a helper, that Eve was Adam's helper. Do you feel like we're demeaning God when we call out to him for help? Absolutely not. This is a complimentary word, a suitable helper. Now, we must think about this whole picture. We are different because we're created uniquely. We're equal. 
But God designed us in such a way that we complete one another as we journey through life. Think about this. I, I think this really may speak even to the issue that we deal with in our society of same-sex relationships. If you have a man who needed a suitable helper, would it make sense for God to create another man with the same set of needs? How would those two complete one another? Wouldn't happen, would it? God in his incredible wisdom says, here's male. Male needs some help. I'm going to bring someone alongside him and the two of them will be great together. They will complete one another. She will be a, a suitable helper. Ladies, never ever think in your marriage that you are somehow inferior, that, you have a, that you're second rate because you're a suitable helper. Let me tell you, we need you and God knew we would and he's given you to us and we are equal though uniquely different. Amen. Okay, it's a little quiet out there, folks. The seventh family foundation idea that we see here is the idea of commitment. Commitment. Look at verse 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The word united there is a word that means to, to stick to. to, stick to. It's a, it's a, a uniting, it's a, it's a coming together. And the, the, the idea that is being portrayed here is the idea of permanence. How many of you in your wedding vows had words to this effect, till death do us part or as long as we both shall live? You had that? Yeah. There's a reason. God's intent is that marriage be a permanent thing between a man and a woman. You say, but... You know, I've had the, the unfortunate experience of divorce and the brokenness of, of that. And we're not here to, to pound on that or be unkind or unloving. What we're trying to do this morning is set the foundation. And God's plan is that there is commitment within marriage. Could I just remind those of you who are married that you made vows before God on your wedding day that you would keep yourself to him or to her as long as you both shall live. It's a commitment that you made to God, a covenant you made with your wife before God. I wanna encourage us to make sure we keep those commitments. That's God's intent. And he says the two of them will become one flesh. Now, we know that he's not saying that when you get married, you become one person. But you become one in heart. You become one in purpose. You have a, have a common goal that you're working towards and, and together you are, you are united. You become one. And obviously this also means one when it comes to a physical, sexual relationship. That's a unique oneness that, that, um, that we don't even fully understand. When it comes to commitment, it seems to me as I look at the scripture that commitment requires selflessness. Commitment requires doing away with selfishness. If we jump very quickly to Ephesians chapter five, Paul is talking to the, to the husbands and the wives and in the, in the bounds of marriage, he says that the, wife is, the husband is the head of the wife and the wife is to submit to the husband and the husband is to love the wife in a sacrificial way as Christ loved the church. When you look at those roles of, of the idea of submission, and we'll get into that in a couple of weeks, so don't stress over it now, uh, the, uh, the idea of loving sacrificially, there is selflessness because when you get to Ephesians 5, 22 or 23, there is mutual submission. We're to submit to one another. It is selflessness. Selflessness is a part of commitment. If you are selfish, you will not keep your commitments. Ouch. Finally, we notice intimacy. In verse 25 of chapter two, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. What we tend to probably think of when we hear the word intimacy is sexual intimacy. 
And that is part of marriage, that, that there, is no, uh, there is no embarrassment in, in the, the unity of the physical body between a man and a woman. That is God's design. How would you procreate if you didn't, right? But it, uh, this idea of intimacy carries with it more than just sexual intimacy. There is the idea within the family of transparency and vulnerability. You know, as a husband and wife, and then as children come into the family, you begin to know more and more. You learn about one another. There's transparency as you share your fears and your concerns and your joys. It's, it's, there's an intimacy that comes with family. But along with that transparency comes vulnerability. I've said it before when I do premarital counseling. I tell the bride and the groom that that as they come to know one another, there's nobody that's going to be able to humiliate them or embarrass them more than the other because you know all about the other one. There's vulnerability in intimacy. These are various foundation stones, if you will, for the family foundation. All of it comes directly from the first two chapters of Genesis as it has to do with the creation of men and women and the beginning of the family structure. I want to conclude this morning by reading to you from Jesus' teachings about the importance of building on a proper foundation. You don't need to turn to it. You might want to write the reference down. Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, Jesus says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Those are Jesus' words, talking about building our lives, our families upon his teaching, and we find that in the word. As we close this morning, a very simple prayer, and I would ask you to join with me as, as I pray for us that God, please help us build our lives and our families on your foundation. Would you join me as I pray this morning? Father, thank you, first of all, for creating family, for the family unit, husband, wife, children, parents, grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, and on down the line. We're grateful for that. We recognize and acknowledge you as the creator of family. And God, we've looked at several traits or characteristics of the family foundation. And maybe there are some this morning who are a little weak in one area or another. Lord, wherever you have just kind of put your thumb on something in our hearts and our lives, in our families' lives. May we have the courage and the desire to make those adjustments so that we align our lives and our families with you. Father, I pray for every family in this, connected with this congregation. We know the enemy is fighting. The enemy wants to destroy and I pray, Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that you will put a hedge of protection around every family in this room, every family connected with Kilpatrick Church. Help us, God, to be strong. Help us to know what your word says and help us to live not only our personal lives, but to, to align our family with what you say is the foundation. We want strong families. We want families that are doing well and not just from a material, earthly perspective, but family that is strong in your eyes. And we know that if we follow your plan, building on your foundation, our house will stand. Lord, let our home stand because we're building on you, I ask. As we go from this place this morning, may your Holy Spirit 
Continue to remind us of your truth this day, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Next week, we're going to be looking at parenting. So if your kids are away from home, come anyway, because you might be a grandparent. It'll be good. God bless. Go live out your faith.